the front line is combat at its most brutal. It drives people to extreme acts for many complex reasons. They were fighting for each other, not for patriotism, but for their buddies. We reveal the most decisive front lines in the Second World War and take you deep into the heart of battle with the men who were there. They were attacking with divisions, and I had one rifle company with about 100 men. I was down to my last box of ammunition. We had no food, and we were hurt. In 1942, the Battle of Midway, the most pivotal naval engagement in the Pacific War between Japan and America. A totally unpredictable event, where a new type of combat redefines the front line. You were in the plane, uh, looking down, hanging from your shoulder straps, going at 500 feet a second, and it hit the target with tremendous impact and the cockpit becomes the decisive weapon. And he did a beautiful job, plunked his 1,000-pound bomb right where it would do the most damage. Myths, mistakes, and mutinies define Midway's front line as one of history's major turning points. First strike in the battle goes to the Japanese. June 1942, the Japanese mount another surprise attack on the Americans in the Pacific, this time on their remote base, Midway Atoll. Six months after the devastating strike on Pearl Harbor, the US is still reeling from the shock and out for revenge. Japanese saw an attack on Pearl Harbor as a way of crippling American power right from the beginning. It also fit in with a long Japanese military tradition of using surprise attacks at the beginning of wars. The outcome of Japan's shock assault on Midway will have a major impact on the wider conflict in the Pacific and revolutionize naval warfare. The Japanese understood that attacking America was a huge gamble, not least because of America's economic power, but obviously they were willing to take that risk. Midway itself is a tiny atoll in the Pacific Ocean, barely six square kilometers of land. It earned its name because of its position, roughly halfway between North America and Asia, 4,100 kilometers east of Tokyo. It started life as a volcano and is now an atoll, a ring-shaped coral reef surrounding a lagoon that includes two pieces of land, Sand Island and Eastern Island, home to a US airbase. It's a tiny little set of sand dunes sticking up above the water. There's no fresh water there. It's home mostly to migratory birds. And its main goal is to serve as a warning and outlying outpost for the Hawaiian Islands themselves. It's actually strategically critical for the Americans, even though there's not really anything there. Its strategic importance makes it the perfect target for the mastermind of Japanese imperial expansion, Admiral Yamamoto. He knows wider victory can only come if he can draw out and quickly destroy America's most powerful warships, its aircraft carriers. Yamamoto thought that the only way to get the American aircraft carriers out of Hawaii was to go and take some American property. The true destructive force of carrier air power 
had been revealed on one infamous day in 1941, the 7th of December, when Japan shocked the world with its surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. We heard a screaming aircraft, and moments later, a terrible explosion. We ran outside the hangar, about 100 yards from me. It was engulfed in smoke and flame. First thing we seen was a circling aircraft overhead with the rising sun insignia. We immediately knew what happened, and uh, everything goes through your mind. Fear, anger, uh, surprise. I seen uh, all uh, battleship rolling fire, the Arizona, the West Virginia, the Tennessee, Nevada, Oklahoma, California. It was a devastating fight, sight I'll never forget. We shouldn't forget about how important that Pacific fleet was to the American public. They were a symbol of American might, both military and industrial. That was our great fleet. That was invulnerable. Those were the best we could build, and the Japanese wiped them out in a day. The battleships are sunk or damaged, but the U.S. carriers are not there. The great irony of the attack at Pearl Harbor was that although the Japanese used this radical new method of warfare, these groups of aircraft carriers, they actually failed to successfully catch any of the American aircraft carriers in port. While the US Navy had its carriers or flat tops, it could stop Admiral Yamamoto's ambitions. Japan's rampage across Asia stepped up a gear in 1937 with the brutal invasion of China that cost millions of lives. Its imperial forces subjugated and terrorized the Chinese before it set out to conquer more of Asia. One of the consequences of this is that America has announced an embargo of oil which will hit the Japanese extremely hard. This would have a crippling effect on not only their economic life, but also their military expansion plans. The Japanese response to the effective oil embargo was to attack Pearl Harbor. By mid-1942, the Japanese Empire occupies Southeast Asia, Malaya, Singapore, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and several Pacific islands. It now pushes into Burma and New Guinea. In early May, a US-led fleet engages them off Australia in the Coral Sea. It was a naval battle between the major capital ships of both sides, but th they never came into contact. It's only their airplanes came into contact. Their warplanes do all the work, as it's also the first carrier versus carrier battle, a chaotic engagement that destroys or damages two Japanese carriers, sinks one American flat top, and leaves the USS Yorktown limping home, trailing oil. At both the Coral Sea and Midway, the front line is defined by the strike range of a carrier's air wing, around 250 to 300 kilometers, well over four times the distance their biggest battleship's guns can fire. The plane is now the decisive weapon. Its armament and endurance, combined with the pilot's observation and flying skills, his instincts and luck are now the critical factors in determining victory at sea. Carrier air power really revolutionized naval warfare at the beginning of World War II. And so almost immediately as navies realized that they could put aircraft on warships, they began thinking about the ways in which those aircraft could deliver 
bombs, torpedoes, all sorts of firepower at a much longer range than a battleship's guns can fire. The Coral Sea leaves Admiral Yamamoto with four big fleet carriers. His plan depends on the US flat tops being in Pearl Harbor and only responding once Midway is occupied. When the US fleet sallied out, we would strike their carriers in a pincer attack from Midway and our carriers. We did not expect to encounter enemy carriers that day at all. It's now the morning of the 4th of June, 1942, a day that will be decisive in the Pacific War. The four Japanese carriers launch a perfectly coordinated strike on Midway with 108 aircraft. I happen to be in the second aircraft to spot this armada approaching Midway. June the 4th, they hit. With the scout plane's warnings, Midway scrambles its bombers to counterattack and fighters to intercept the incoming strike wave. The Marines were equipped with an obsolete aircraft, the Brewster Buffalo. They sent 27 of them aloft, only seven of them returned, and they were badly damaged. The Marine interceptors are cut to pieces by the highly maneuverable Zero fighters. While the Japanese bombers start to set Midway ablaze, destroying the hangars and fuel dump. Mid-1942, Henderson Airfield, Midway Island. The US Marines that are defending it have got machine guns, and most of them are armed with one of these an M1 Garand rifle. Gas-operated, semi-automatic, eight-round clip. First strike in the battle goes to the Japanese. Infantry hate aircraft. That's a fact. A weapon like this is excellent for fighting other infantry. It is less good trying to hit an aircraft very, very high in the air. What the Marines had at Henderson Airfield that made the difference was machine guns. And it's those machine guns that were the real aircraft killers on the day. They shoot down or damage around 25 of the attackers and dispatch B-17 bombers to follow the planes already engaging the Japanese fleet. Our people on the islands tried to reciprocate by going after their shipping, but those people were not experienced in naval bombardment. And so far as I know, they, they never got a single hit on the Japanese ships. But what it did do was force the Japanese to maneuver and to defend their fleet with their fighters. This ties up the carrier's decks with fighter operations stopping the launching of more bombers, which are needed as the first Japanese strike fails to destroy all its targets. The decision to launch a second attack to finish the job will have dramatic consequences. The attack is carried out by Japan's veteran pilots using their state-of-the-art aircraft. The Val dive bomber, a highly effective ship killer, the Cape torpedo bomber is seen as the biggest threat to the US forces with its powerful payload. Both are also highly effective ground assault bombers. The Zero fighter is light, maneuverable, and armed with powerful 20 millimeter cannons, able to climb three times faster than its US rivals. It's unmatched at the time. The second Japanese strike wave planned to cripple Midway seems invincible. However, the three American flat tops they believe are in Pearl Harbor, 1,700 kilometers away, are in fact now approaching them rapidly.
Two days earlier, three US carriers and their escorts secretly rendezvoused at Point Luck, about 500 kilometers northeast of Midway, and deploy for battle. The Japanese know nothing about them. The Japanese had 21 submarines available to them. And the picket line, which should have been surrounding Pearl Harbor, was not in place in time. It was two days late. And thus, by catching the uh, Japanese by surprise, uh, the Americans now already have the upper hand and uh, an awful lot of opportunities here in the Battle of Midway. The American fleet has evaded the enemy blockade around Pearl Harbor and is closing fast on Midway. Another US strike wave launched from Midway fails to score any hits on the Japanese fleet at great cost. Eight of 16 are shot down. On the bridge of his flagship, Admiral Yamamoto believes his attack is running almost a plan. What he doesn't know is that his enemies have, in effect, been reading his mind. The Americans had another advantage at Midway. The code-breaking effort at Pearl Harbor, led by a naval officer by the name of Joseph Rochefort, had actually managed to break a fair amount of the Japanese naval codes. Workaholic Rochefort is an eccentric genius with a simple philosophy. If you desire to be a really great cryptanalyst, being a little bit nuts helps. An intelligence officer has one job, to tell his commander today what the Japanese are going to do tomorrow. But his team can only break some of the Japanese radio signals. And exactly what the Americans know has been exaggerated. It's not like the Japanese were sending out detailed plans of exactly what they were going to do. And so part of this code-breaking effort is not just breaking the code, it's then assembling the jigsaw puzzle of information you get out of it. And so Rochefort was able to give Nimitz something of a picture of what was about to happen. The code-breaking suggests the Japanese are planning a mass attack but the target is only referred to as AF. Rochefort secretly orders Midway to radio that its water purification system had broken down. There was a note that this target, what the, the Japanese referred to as AF, was running short of fresh water because the distiller had broken. This was, for Nimitz, was enough confirmation to decide that Midway was the target that the Japanese were going after. It seems AF is in fact Midway. But by deciding to take the bait and defend the island, Admiral Nimitz is gambling. And the stakes are all his aircraft carriers. If they've analyzed the wrong information, if they have made the wrong decision based on the information and intelligence they have analyzed, then they will have a problem. The odds against Nimitz's great gamble are worsened by the state of his ships and men after their losses at Coral Sea. They all needed replenishment. The air groups needed replacement pilots and planes for those that had been lost. On the 27th of May, the damaged Yorktown finally limps into Pearl Harbor, still trailing oil. It needs 90 days of repairs. But Admiral Nimitz says they can only have three. On the 30th of May, she sets sail for Midway, with the repair team still on board filling the holes to face a completely undefeated and powerful Japanese fleet. Risking our carriers for the two little sand spits in the middle of the ocean. The Enterprise and Hornet had departed for Midway two days earlier. And then the Yorktown magically 
disappeared. So there were now three of us. We had heard that there were as many as six Japanese carriers, so it had kind of even up the odds just a little bit when the Yorktown came online. No one then knew that, in fact, Admiral Yamamoto only commands four carriers. But even today, many still believe one of Midway's biggest myths. The legend around Midway is that the Americans were underdogs, that the, uh, the plucky, undermanned, under-equipped American fleet somehow managed a miraculous upset over an overwhelmingly large Japanese fleet. It's true that Yamamoto commands many more warships, including battleships, but the crucial balance of power is in aircraft. Again, the Japanese do have a slight advantage at sea. 248 aircraft on four carriers compared to around 230 on America's three flat tops. And most importantly, the Japanese have to worry not just about the American aircraft carriers, but they had to worry about the airstrip on Midway itself. Midway's airfield deploys over 100 more combat aircraft. So this idea that America was outnumbered, outgunned, is entirely mythical. That morning, the first Japanese strike leaves Midway burning but calls for a second wave to finish the job. Yamamoto's deputy, Admiral Nagumo, is in operational command of the four carriers. He orders his planes rearmed to bomb the island. So their deadly anti-ship torpedoes are removed. Nagumo still does not know the Americans are closing. His scout planes report nothing. until just over an hour after the attack on Midway, when they glimpse enemy warships, but cannot identify their type. They should have flown lower and lower until they were right on the deck, even if it cost them their lives. Admiral Nagumo halts the rearming. But who have they spotted? Nagumo dithered, and he couldn't quite decide what to do, that hesitation actually turns into a fatal one for Nagumo and for the Japanese aircraft carriers. Just as he hears US warships are approaching, bombs start to explode around the Japanese carriers. Unseen at a high altitude, Midway's B-17 bombers attack. Trying to hit an aircraft carrier from 20,000 feet with a bomb is rather like dropping a marble on a scuttling cockroach. The chances of the B-17s actually causing any damage were pretty small. But they do force the carriers to turn violently to avoid the falling bombs. Just as Admiral Nagumo's scout plane reports the news he most fears. Enemy force accompanied by what appears to be an aircraft carrier bringing up the rear. Nagumo only has a very small force of dive bombers ready to go. But all his fighters are engaging the American bombers. He now faces a critical decision. Launch a suicidal attack without fighter escorts or wait for a mass offensive. First strike advantage is absolutely essential for the obvious reason. If you can, you can bury the, the opposition aircraft carrier, it can no longer send up planes to attack you. But Admiral Nagumo also faces another problem. His strike wave is returning from midway and must land 
as it is low on fuel. It is feasible he could have got some planes off, but it would have been at the cost of very large numbers of planes coming back from the first strike on, on Midway. So Nagumo is caught, I think, in, in, in almost an impossible position. He cannot launch any planes while others land. In retrospect, I think Nagumo made the wrong decision. The real threat was the American aircraft carriers. Those were the ones, those were the ones that he had to deal with. I don't think you can blame Nagumo here. He doesn't know where the Americans have found the Japanese fleet and have launched aircraft. So he's really in the, in the dark here. But if the Japanese admiral is in the dark, the American aviators are clear on their mission. Attack. Of course, the pilots dashed up there and revved up their engines and, and took off. The Americans did not hesitate. The Enterprise and Hornet launched their mass strike wings 90 minutes before they are even seen by the Japanese scout plane. I wanted to hit the Japanese carriers as early as possible, with all the air strength I had available for this purpose. But his bold move is followed by a shambles as the different squadrons struggle to form their attack formations in the air. And sad to say, the Hornet and Enterprise pilots had to circle the task force helplessly. So we lost some valuable time and very, very valuable aviation gas. It is over an hour before Hornet's strike force finally departs. When you look at the airstrike that the Americans had launched, it was kind of chaotic. And at least one unit of planes heading off in completely the wrong direction for the aircraft carriers. All four squadrons of the Hornets Air Group, led by Commander Stanhope Ring, head due west. Rather than southwest, where the Japanese carriers had been spotted. For reasons which have never been fully explained and possibly never will be explained, they set off their pilots on a course that was due west, which was never going to catch the Japanese fleet. Far below Commander Ring's dive bombers, Hornet's torpedo bombers are led by Lieutenant Commander John Waldron. He breaks radio silence. You're going the wrong direction for the Japanese carrier force. The hell with you. I know where they are, and I'm going to them. Waldron disobeys orders and banks to the southwest, followed by his whole torpedo squadron to hunt for the Japanese carriers. Then the fighter escorts and dive bombers also abandon Commander Ring. But now, dangerously low on fuel, 13 out of 24 are forced to ditch into the sea before they can reach Midway. Technically speaking, this is, this is disobedience of a senior officer in combat. It could even be classified as a, as a mutiny. But no one is punished as it is covered up. As long as you were successful, you were pretty much excused after the battle was over. By chance, Waldron's men are filmed a few days earlier. But what happened to them that morning? Within 45 minutes, Waldron finds the Japanese carriers. And without any fighter escorts or dive bomber support, his squadron drops to 60 meters and attacks. Flying into swarms of Zero fighters and then dense anti-aircraft fire, 
in their aged Douglas Devastators. Which was only devastating in terms of how slow it was and how vulnerable it was as an aeroplane. American radio operators hear some transmissions from John Waldron. Watch those fighters. Attack immediately. My two wingmen are going in the water. The Zeros jumped on us, and it was too late. I figured that there was about 35 of them. You just gotta fly up to the ship and then take whatever you get. I dropped the torpedo and was fortunate enough to get away from the anti-aircraft fire, although everything was shooting at me. Ensign Gay is the only survivor from those 30 men. His squadron scores no hits. They're armed with the infamous Mark 13 torpedo, already thought to be fatally flawed. They did the test. It was too slow. The firing pins didn't work. And it couldn't operate at the right level in the water to be able to hit a ship. They ran erratically, they ran deep, and some of them just hit the hull of the ships that they were targeting, and the torpedoes broke up and sank without exploding. So effectively, John Waldron, with his squadron of torpedo bombers, went into attack with duds. The chance of any of them actually going off and sinking a Japanese aircraft carrier were practically zero. Waldron's sacrifice, a decision made by just a handful of pilots, redefines the front line in naval air warfare. The pilots, the people sitting in the planes, have got a very and fundamentally different experience of warfare from what you would, for example, find in a land situation. These individual pilots can, in the right circumstances, determine the outcome of an entire battle and now transform warfare. This was completely new stuff, new war machines and uh, new tactics. It was very early, early days. Further proof of this comes on the second American carrier, the USS Enterprise, whose squadrons also get totally split up. Like the Hornets, her dive bombers and fighters have also entirely lost track of the enemy carriers. But somehow, her torpedo bombers find them. But will they share Waldron's fate? Enterprise's devastator torpedo attack is led by Lieutenant Commander Eugene Lindsay. Their attack is almost as suicidal as Waldron's. Most are shot down and killed, causing no damage to Yamamoto's carriers. It really does look like the charge of the Light Brigade into cannon fodder. But it had the crucial effect of bringing the Japanese air cover down to ground level. It also made them short of fuel and ammunition, so they needed to come back to their ships to be refueled and reloaded with ammunition. And this set up the perfect opportunity for the one attack weapon that the Americans had, which did work. These are the dive bombers off the Enterprise, but they still can't find the carriers. Arriving at the estimated point of contact, the sea was empty. Not a Jap vessel was in sight. Unlike the vulnerable Devastator, the other American strike aircraft is more modern. The dauntless SBD dive bomber is affectionately known as slow, but deadly. With a good range, decent payload, and a rear-firing gunner for defence. Veteran aviator Wade McCluskey 
leads Enterprises to squadrons of dauntless dive bombers. More than two hours of searching bravely takes them way past the point of safe return in their determination to find and attack the enemy. I knew, and most everybody else knew, that we didn't have enough fuel to get back. As the Japanese warships have no radar, it's now a deadly game of who will spot the enemy first. McCluskey says, we're going to press on just a little longer. And just moments later, he spotted the white wake of a fast-moving Japanese destroyer, and he says, that ship has to be racing to rejoin the main fleet. We'll follow it. McCluskey gambles all his plane's fate on a hunch. But the enemy destroyer is speeding back to the four carriers. Peering through my binoculars, which were practically glued to my eyes, I saw dead ahead about 35 miles distance the welcome sight of the Jap carrier striking force. Found the Japanese carriers and they were just ripe for the plucking. No fighter uh, defense up in the air there. They were all down battling the torpedo planes. So our, de our dive bombers had a, just a beautiful shot, as beautiful as could be. Meanwhile, the third American carrier, the damaged Yorktown, launches its strike wing well after the Enterprise. But their more experienced crews quickly catch up with McCluskey. The Yorktown's planes converge on the four Japanese carriers at the same time as McCluskey, by pure chance. At high altitude, the Yorktown's dive bombers arrive from a different direction to McCluskey's planes, while at sea level, her 12 torpedo bombers start their attack. But this time, they go in with a fighter escort. Their Wildcats may climb much slower than the Zero, but can survive a real beating. The six Wildcat fighters bravely battle more than three dozen attacking Zeros. We tore into the torpedo bombers flying low, straight and true. We felt torpedoes were the biggest threat since a single torpedo could sink a ship. I was impressed at how bravely they pushed home their attacks. Outnumbered? and outclassed, the American torpedo bombers start to fall from the sky. Then I saw this glint in the sun, and it just looked like a beautiful silver waterfall, these dive bombers coming down. I've never seen such superb dive bombing. Up at nearly 6,000 meters, McCluskey leads his 30 planes into their terrifying vertical descent onto the nearest Japanese carrier, the Kaga. I saw the top of the dive bomber as it flipped upside down. It hung like a spider on a thread coming right down at us. At 760 meters, they drop their 500-pound bombs. The first three miss, then four hit the Kaga. The ship turned into an inferno. The crew was left with little to fight the flames. The deck was packed with the injured, dying and those too exhausted to move. Dive bombing is one of the least understood weapons that's ever existed. You were in a plane uh, looking down, hanging from your solar straps. In the Battle of Midway, pilots would drop at about 2,500 feet. You're going at 500 feet a second, and it hit the target with tremendous impact. At least one bomb punches through the wooden flight deck and sets off the ordnance in the hangar. You have all the conditions for an absolute catastrophe, and the cargo 
just blows out its sides. All the ammunition goes up and the, the ship essentially is immediately completely written off in, in, within an instant. But beside the Kaka is another Japanese carrier. In a terrible error, all of the American dive bombers have attacked the Kaga. Lieutenant Dick Best spots McCluskey's mistake and orders his second squadron to abort. McCluskey apparently did not know that pro protocol called for him hitting the furthest away carrier. So he attacked the nearest carrier. Most of our people hit the nearest carrier. Four minutes later, Lieutenant Best dives on the second Japanese carrier, the Akagi. His bomb punches through the flight deck and explodes in the plane-filled hangar. And he did a beautiful job on it, plunked his 1,000-pound uh, bomb right where it would do the most damage. As Best pulls out of his dive, he sees a third Japanese carrier burst into flames. Yorktown's dive bombers have hit the Soryu three times, starting fatal fires on the flight deck and in the hangars. In the space of a few minutes, strikes by just eight bombs devastate three of the Japanese carriers. A little later in the day, after three aircraft were sunk, uh, Admiral Spruance called uh, Admiral Nimitz and says, uh, we've had a good day, Admiral. We sunk three aircraft carriers. Do you think that's enough? He said, hell no, I want the fourth one. But before the Americans can regroup, the Japanese strike back. Their only unscathed carrier, the Hiryu, launches a counterattack. The American strikes have proven how few hits can destroy three heavily defended carriers. But another technological advantage now comes into play for the American fleet, radar. They detect the enemy strike planes about 75 kilometers away, allowing more US fighters to scramble as those on patrol are vectored to intercept. 12 Wildcats shoot down 10 of the attacking 18 Val dive bombers. Two more fall to the barrage of anti-aircraft fire thrown up by the Yorktown and her escorts. But the six surviving Vals execute a textbook dive bomb, scoring three hits from just 150 meters. When I took off, the Yorktown was the fightingest ship in the Navy. And when I got back, it was dead in the water. I flew down close to take a look, and all I could see were dead men on deck. There just wasn't anybody alive on board. That was an eerie sight. A second airstrike proves the potency of the Japanese torpedoes over the American duds, as two hit the Yorktown, stopping her and creating a severe list. We saw the Yorktown being attacked. And uh, my feelings were, that's our sister ship. I don't like it. Crews tackle the fires that break out on the Yorktown. In the Second World War, few injuries are feared like Burns injury, whether it's the metal tube of an aircraft or trapped below decks on a ship that's under attack. Fire can rip through, catching everything from supplies to uniforms to human hair and do extraordinary damage that's very painful and very difficult to fix. 
It isn't just about losing the skin, suffering the burn from the fire itself. The body's own response to the burn is the thing that will ultimately kill the patient. You know when you have a small burn that you get a blister. Fluid from your system has gone to the site of the, of the wound to replace the fluid lost by the high temperatures. Imagine that happening on not just a small burn on your finger, but all over your body. The body can't sustain the loss of that much fluid from major organs to external skin damage. And it shuts down. It goes into something that we call wound shock. Perhaps surprisingly, what we're looking at on this table are the basic principles of good burns treatment. This is the cutting edge in 1944. You need to dress it to keep it clean, to keep it free of infection. But we also need to bear in mind that that dressing will have to be removed. Every time you take a dressing off, you're effectively removing the surface and exposing it to infection all over again. So petroleum jelly, really simple compound, becomes a key component of burns treatment. You slather petroleum jelly over the burn surface and then you apply the dressing. And it means that the dressing can be removed atraumatically. They're not taking away a layer of healing that's already started to happen. And in addition to these two quite simple things, saline, salted water, replacing the fluid lost at the burn site, Three really simple things, but they're the foundation of saving the life of a badly burned patient. There is still in the United States a tremendous reticence about letting the public see the consequences of the war. So when service personnel are returned, particularly from the Far East, who've sustained burns injury, who've got this kind of scarring that can be fairly difficult to look at, to understand and to process, they're generally hidden away. They're taken into hospitals behind high walls and they continue their treatment and very little attention is paid to them publicly as having served their country. As the damage control crews battle to save the listing Yorktown, her operational planes and pilots fight on from the other US carriers and then locate the Hiryu. Ten of the Yorktown's dive bombers now join 14 from the Enterprise to hit the Hiryu. Again, Lieutenant Best scores, making it two for two, devastating the enemy. Four explosions leave her aflame, and she sinks the next morning. I was shot down and later rescued, the ship's doctor said. We treat the lightly injured and ignore the badly wounded. They are a waste of resources. This is the reality of war. It is cruel and unforgiving. As the sun sets over the crippled Yorktown, Admiral Spruance takes overall command on the Enterprise. But Admiral Yamamoto still believes his fast, ship-killing battleships can even the score. The front line is now determined by the range of his battleship guns, far less than the strike range of the US aircraft. But those are now useless in the darkness. That night, the Japanese try to find the US carriers with their powerful warships. Admiral Spruance eventually orders a withdrawal, defying the outrage of his officers who want to continue the attack. His wise decision saves the American carriers from possible destruction by the battleships. In the night, two heavy Japanese cruisers collide, damaging one badly, while the second is sunk by US warplanes on the 6th of June. That cruiser was twisting and turning, making turns that pulled you right over on your back. We were dropping bombs all around it. It was throwing up a flock of anti-aircraft shells. One got sent. For the first time, I really hated them. Admiral Yamamoto cancels the midway operation. 
When we returned to, uh, to Pearl Harbor, we were greeted by Admiral Nimitz. He shook hands with everybody. It was quite a homecoming. Japan has suffered a huge defeat, losing 248 aircraft, four big carriers, a heavy cruiser, and around 3,000 men. By comparison, the US Navy loses about 150 planes, one carrier, a destroyer, and just over 300 men. The argument for Midway being one of the most critical moments in the Pacific War is absolutely valid. The loss of four Japanese carriers really did shift the momentum in the Pacific from what had been a really uninterrupted stream of Japanese victories. It also gave a great boost to the whole Allied war effort, handing them the initiative. Before Midway, the Japanese carriers dictated the flow of the war between America and Japan. After Midway, it was the Americans who dictated the, the pace and the sequencing of the war. But when we turned the tide in Midway, it was a relief, it was a, it was a great pleasure, and it's gone down in history now as, as one of the greatest naval battles of all time. A Japanese trap became an American ambush and totally transformed naval warfare. <laughs>